Hey everyone, welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast. Before we go any further, just do us a massive favor and hit that subscribe or follow button in front of you. It's a key performance indicator for the podcast and it really helps us measure success of every single episode. We often see it in specifications where they say there must be a relief valve. We don't have a relief valve because we don't need one, but someone else's pump would need one because the amount of back pressure that's going on, so it doesn't blow the pump to smithereens. Some services will still run with a collecting head on the suction inlet, and that is a weak point if the pressure relief on a pump is not doing its job correctly, and I have seen them where they break them, the collecting head explodes. It is an asset, obviously an expensive asset for the authorities, still has to do its job, and we all know, and we talk about it constantly, is firefighter safety. And as we know, there have been fatalities, and a few, too many, in last five to 10 years, probably too, too many. And you go, what is it that we're doing, or what is the services doing, that actually they don't actually need to do because they're putting their people at risk? And it's like you just said, about some of the rules that you have, mm-hmm. There has to, at some point, there's a line in the sand that says, just do that, because actually that's the safest. This week, we were heading down to the Rosenbauer headquarters in the UK to speak with their managing director, Nick Ewins. In this first part of a two-part episode, we go walking through the bays and look at some of the equipment, the technology, and the vehicles that are being made by one of the world's largest manufacturers of goods for the fire and emergency services market. In our follow-up episode in a few days, you will hear us sit down with Nick and his business development manager, Andrew Smith, as we delve deeper into the history of Rosenbauer and also have a sneak peek at some of the exciting things they have planned for 2022 and the years to come. So today's a whistle-stop tour. You're going to hear some in-depth aspects of how these vehicles go together, the origins of their famous hero helmets, and also some of the ways they are innovating some of the new technologies in the industry to face the ongoing challenges of fire and emergency services around the world. Thanks for coming back to the Firefighters Podcast. If you're listening on Spotify, please give as a rating and we hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Nick Ewins, UK Managing Director of Rosenbauer. So Nick, what are we looking at right here? We are in the, I want to call it the bays, I probably should get stuck into my own terminology of the fire service bays. We have a plethora, almost <laughs> an Aladdin's cave of, of vehicles in front of us. What are we looking at? Yeah, we, we do. We've been here five years now. So where, where are we, if we're, we're, if we're, we're allowed to we're, say? We're, we're in Meltham, which Meltham. is a okay. dis- district of Holmfirth. As you can, Beautiful drive. It's a lovely drive. As I you, was in the lakes yeah, not too yeah. long ago, and it's a very similar drive down to this, yeah, with is, all the, the stone walls and the beautiful sort it is of very picturesque. environment. You, you, can, it. you can tell by my accent that I'm not from these parts, <laughs> but, you know, but still love coming in. Uh, you know, so, yeah, we've been here five years. We just actually renewed the lease for another ten years. Another ten years? Yep, we have. And we're the is it land- big enough? Because I know enough? the number of vehicles you produce, and obviously it's not just the vehicles, it's the PPE, it's the pumps, it's the fans, it's the helmets, it's the kit. It, 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 it is big enough <laughs> okay. at, at the moment, uh, and is in ideally in a... I, I like the location yeah. because it's out of the way. Mm. That does have some drawbacks, however, it is about the way. My, in my previous experiences, if you're on an industrial estate of some sort, that does bring other challenges for unwanted visitors. And, yeah, most definitely. You know, what, what do I like about the building? I like the size of it. What yeah. don't I like? I don't like the single door because you're bringing trucks in and out. Ah, yes. On the other hand, what do I really like about it? I like the single door at the front from a security point of view. Yeah, so yeah. That, that's really good. Yeah, you kind of want to be um, yeah. out the way. Because we nice have some high niche, expensive things have, that we, we have, have in here. Asset value. We've got a beautiful stuff. stream next to the site as well. Really? Okay, I quite like the look yeah. of that. I could see yeah. me getting down there and getting yeah. in some cold water in the winter. Uh, we we have gone down a bit further down and done some pump testing. Have you? It's a bit down on the other side there. There's a bit. Beautiful. We do. We have an on-call firefighter who's one of our employees. Yes, so just be quite on before. Yeah, yeah. there's so, a great level of authenticity of having somebody like that. Yeah. An end user working inside the business because I think that's quite a rare thing now as well. It astonishes me, especially now in the UK and Fire and Rescue Service, the amount of people that come up to retirement. There must be a real myriad of experience out there that people could really benefit from. Yes, there, there are. And he, because obviously a lot of people now commute, don't they? And mm. they commute further than what you would normally do. I mean, where I live, you know, I am within spitting distance of the fire station actually because. The chief of Surrey joked with me once and said, oh, you could be an on-call firefighter. Like, yeah, not my age, <laughs> thanks very much, but, because I am within two miles of the fire station. But, yeah. So, so yeah, 20-odd thousand square feet of storage area. So a training area, which, we've cool. de- which we're developing over in the part here, which we can do training because we do training for all the products. Oh, wonderful. So it's a big part of what we do. From refurbishing the helmets, okay. we do training and we will train people. 
We do have an online portal anyway, so some of our... When we say training, are we talking train, about... We're training to take it apart, how to adjust it, how to clean it. That used to be a really frustrating yeah. thing for me, like 10 years ago, when you had to have a specially trained person in the service who was qualified to take the back of the yeah. torch battery lot off. And you're like, are you joking? Yeah. It's a Philips you know, I'm, I'm not going to break it too much, but the helmets do seem to be getting more and more <coughs> complex. So you are empowering. So when people purchase stuff, we said before, people that take out these big PPE leases don't always have the after sales support. And we're speaking no. to a gentleman upstairs. Yep. Just gets lands in a bunch of boxes and then do as you please. And then when you've got to struggle with all the different people we have, yep. different shapes and sizes, yep. you need somebody with a bit of a niche. So you're, yep. you train people to do that we as well. We do. And when our helmet was selected for the national framework, obviously that was through Bristol Uniforms because they're the, you know, the, the big players in the UK market doing Indeed. a managed service of uniforms. Mm -hmm. right? So that's too big a business for us. However, yeah. we can supply helmets, and the, ours is the helmet of choice. Yours we, seems to be the helmet of choice for a long... I know it's something we're going to get into in our conversation, but how, how has it been such a helmet of choice for so incredibly long? It, I, I know when we talk about Rosenbauer, that may be what a few people only associate with Rosenbauer. Obviously, standing here today, I, I, know I the would, myriads, I would say, in, in my time with the company, not having had previous experience of... PPE or helmets or anything, yep. is that my predecessor here actually did a great job in actually promoting Indeed. the helmet into the market. Mm. And the other thing from a company point of view is that I think we're much more trusted mm. than possibly our competitors are to support the product with our mm. relationship with the customers. We, we don't sell it and forget it. No. You know, you know, we are, and we do do it. We've done it with Bristol uniforms where we've had special fits or there's been a small issue because Everybody's got a different size head. Yeah, <laughs> and, definitely. And there are challenges around that sometimes. And rather than just saying to Bristol, well, actually, that's your problem. We've yeah. been places dotted around or we've had people helmets returned mm. and we've done a special fit, either large or small, mm. because we want to keep, it might be one helmet out mm. of the 30,000 we've supplied. Yeah but we're still very interested in that one individual. We only need to drop the ball in, in one situation yeah. like that and it can, yeah. it can damage some real brands. I look at your helmet process a little bit like, uh, if you excuse it for a second, the sort of distilling process of alcohol. And what I mean by that is you've been in the helmet market for so long, you've been able to go through that cycle of innovation yeah. eight, nine times. Most people just coming into the market will go through yeah. the cycle once and they've still been through the cycle and they'll say, mm. we've studied this and we've tested it on firefighters and blah, 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 blah. But you've done that iterative cycle we, so we many times yep. for, from the tapering around the yep. side of it to the 17 probably adjustments that you can make to it. Yep. It does just get distilled. It gets it, better it, and better it, and better. It does. The, the original helmet, when the helmets were first on, it was, a, it was a project by one of the guys over at the factory who's into the PPE markets, his nice. little baby. And the original helmets, they were actually using the company that, that had the injection moulding facilities to make the shell. Mm. And then that is how it grew out of that business. And then eventually, and it's only within the last four years probably, where they went, okay, right, this is really serious now. We've got yeah. a new generation of helmet that we're kind of going to develop that. Yeah. By the way, here's our lovely new specific facility for doing this. And yeah. it's a new place in Austria and it's, it's been around four years. And so they've invested and they, the company does do that. It's, if you look at the P&L, you see the amount they invest every year in R&D. It's an enormous yeah. amount of money. And it goes from the helmet to what will become the E Panther. Yeah, <laughs> so look you're at that talking fact. something that's a well. Correct me if I'm wrong as well, yeah. because a, a lot of market people that try and get into this market just go after singularly firefighters and helmets, for example. But you you don't just serve firefighters; a lot of your PPE go across the whole of the emergency services. We're right in saying that. Right there are saying. different models of helmet and yeah. different models of gloves. Because we clothing. see our, our police and certainly our paramedics yeah. historically, they were less supported with things like PPE. And I know that's now become recognized with the, I mean, the, the NHS is a behemoth. Yep. Um, so the people that yep. are there serving that market as well, which yep. I know includes yourselves, are really somebody that's, that, that's getting, that's seeing the more holistic view of the needs of the emergency services versus just yep. the, you know, the people that come out with a helmet. It feels a bit like a wobbly bucket. I remember yep. 15 years ago when I put mine on and it yep. used to smack you in the side of the neck. Yep. That's the main reason you did your collar up because it was quite sharp edges, to be honest, with a thin bit of rubber on that didn't last very long. Yeah, we, we learned, and if you picked up the two helmets and gave it to someone like yourself who maybe had the old Rosenbauer helmet yeah, yeah. and said, can you see the difference? You, you more likely would go, yes, I can straight away because that edge has disappeared yeah, and yeah. the balance of it with the torch on yeah. is different to what the other. So you've learned the lesson. From Tiny the little moment. things like, you know, we'd, we'd strap the radio to our tunics and it would always catch on the side of the helmet and it would 
push yeah. it off yeah. an angle, whereas they're tapering now. Yeah. And we see in the, in the firefighter challenges, some people that will say, oh, I've got one of the originals. And I mm. don't see that as a benefit when people say, oh, I've got a, a helmet that's been around for 20 years. I'm like, dude, you want one of the new ones? Because honestly, and you see it when they're rolling hose and it's dropping off. It's, it's not got all the adjustments. It doesn't sit as well no. with the individual. And when you are running up flights of stairs and when you're yeah. doing the operational role, it's those small things that make a big difference. Yeah. This is our training area. We are slightly unique in the fact that we're a subsidiary company of the actual manufacturer. So sitting in this room here, we've gone from some refurbing some helmets. We've got a truck pump, so that's out of the trunk. We use that for training. Do you get many people trying to purchase these as, as, as training things? Because we used to have a few in my service that we'd have at learning and development. I'm seeing them less and less. But I think it'd be so nice for people to be able to sort of viscerally understand how it works rather than just, you know, you turn up to an electrical device with the e-pumps and stuff these days, press a button and this happens. But do you conceptually understand what's actually happening in the yeah. two-stage yeah. reciprocating pump, blah, blah, yeah. blah, you know, all of that. Yes. You can only really get a comprehension for it if you see a stripped down yeah. pump. So uh, at our, that's uh, a real gap at in, the, tra in the, tra knowledge, at the training school in uh, Austria. Yeah. So if you walked down the corridor of where that is, because there's several classrooms, it's a fairly decent facility. Yeah. Is that you'll see, say, one of these. You might see another one out of a pamphlet. You might see the high pressure pump, blah, blah, and they'll have been cut in half. Yeah. That's and exactly so you can see the about. so you can see the internals of the volute yeah. and the impellers in yeah. there because. The way that the Rosenbauer pump is developed is that this section here, this, this part here is the low pressure part, yep. which Austrians call normal pressure. So if you yep. see N and P written on something, that's because it's normal pressure, which is low. Yep. This part here is the three impellers of the high pressure pump. You can have that pump and that pump together to make yep. a twin stage pump, or yep. you could have that pump, or you could have that pump. Love so, it. so a lot of the old changeovers used to simply go... <coughs> from the, the normal pressure from the low pressure and include yep. the higher pressure and it constantly reciprocating round both versions with that one. They're working on a common shaft. Because there used to be issues yep. with, with the compressed air foam systems when they tried to yep. incorporate them but they didn't want to use the peripheral impeller and we used to have issues getting foam in tanks but we had a myriad of issues. I think a lot of it came as well though from like I say people didn't conceptually understand it. No. They were just looking at it from the front mm. and we'd use all the mm. buzzwords yeah. but you didn't because so many of them are electronic now as well I used to do drills where you'd have somebody standing, well, I still try and do it, but it's harder with some of the e-pumps. Stand next to the vehicle, and I'm gonna do several things at the back. I want you to tell me what I'm doing, because you should understand the difference in pitch. But that becomes so alien to people, they just press a button and it's just a noise now. Yeah. And, and that worries me, you know, I'm not too nostalgic, but it's important to have a good understanding of what's actually happening. I, it, it does happen, I've been on several places yeah. where firefighters are using the pump and you go, oh, You don't sure. wanna get into that in my day yeah. conversation, but still. No, you, it's, it's interesting to see that development, because mm. Because I get involved in sort of various generations of people, and I've been doing it a long time, and I used to go, "Why are you doing that?" Mm. And, and there have the been why. several instances, yeah. and, it, and it can be that they're you know fairly new recruits, or they've been in the service say five years or something like that, and they're doing it because that's the way the guy told them to do it. And there's a weak part in the training. So yeah. if you go to more or less, I would say, any training place in a fire service, and you go, oh, so what, what are you doing then? Yeah. You see this 20-year-old fire engine. Oh, we're doing training on the new recruits. Oh, okay, well, well, where are they going? Oh, they're going, then. of course, they'll go to the new station where they've got the 2021 model fire engine. So nothing like that one then. <laughs> yeah. So that <laughs> doesn't make a lot of sense. massive knowledge so gap. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But yeah. the fundamentals yeah. is still... You've got to, you've got to stop yourself. I get really romantic about... Yeah hydrodynamics and stuff like that and you can go far too deep and that's where I do lose and bore people I appreciate that no but it, it's worth knowing because there's an in between the somewhere on the spectrum we should all be the Rosenbauer pump if you got the performance graph and looked at it mm. uh, if you can understand it, it's quite complicated because <laughs> even I struggle even now um, and you looked at one from our competitors pump say ours is on a piece of landscape paper and theirs is on a bit of portrait it's because the curve performance curve of the Rosenbauer pump is much shallower Okay. because the way the impeller and the volute is designed okay. and the consequence of that is when you're doing gas cooling and you can ram the branch shut yeah. the pressure back into this pump yeah, is yeah, much yeah. less than our so effectively pump. the water hammer and how it dispels it through the pump it versus the, the, yes. the, the, the load and longevity of correct. the pump if it's, if it's consistently have to damage with those that's spikes correct. that's correct yeah. and so you will on this pump we often see it in specifications where say there must be a relief valve we don't have a relief valve because we don't need one but someone else's pump would need one because the amount of back pressure that's going on so it doesn't blow the pump to smithereens yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's an interesting thing because even that when we talk about <coughs> catastrophic um, pump failures and stuff like that oh, I've I, had always, it before. I like to run yeah. drills and say how, how can yeah. you get water out of that now yeah. and I go yeah. well, I can't turn it on it doesn't matter it's still just a lump of steel if you understand yeah. how it works 
gravitation will, will, yeah. fall, that will fall out of it Absolutely. if you can just then yeah. um, put a pump server. Some, some services will still run with a collecting head on the suction inlet, mm -hmm. and that is a weak point if the pressure relief on a pump is not doing its job correctly, and I have seen them where they mm. break them, or yeah. the collecting head explodes. <laughs> really? Is that, yeah. Crikey. Yeah, okay. is that, yeah, yeah, it's because it's a catastrophic failure with the amount of pressure that's coming back. So say you mm. get eight bar coming back down the pump, that's, yeah. if there's not a way of relieving it. Or the so, really and I know I don't want to get, get too deep into it, but it's something certainly from my service is still a, a big bone of contention with. When I do the, we do things called Pump Champions course and stuff like that, mm. where you go and you do a little bit more specialised, you become a bit of a workplace trainer. Either pump or straight to tank, come when you're using the filler. Straight to tank. Straight to tank, thank God, good. Some people go out of the pump because you can use, you can use the, you know, the, the strength of the water coming from the hydrogen. So if you haven't got control of it, there's no, constant fluctuations there. It. Yeah. So it, think there's a bath in here. I want you to just feed the bath because this is this knows the pressure of that and it will deal with that all day long. It'll be consistent, on off jets everywhere, hydrogen pressures up and down, fluctuations. It doesn't matter. This will no. absorb all of that. Mm. And they say, oh no, but I always, I always like to have a full tank because that's my safety net. I said, I know, I, I understand that. But don't put it, don't, don't put it in there. No. And I almost want it to come mm. off, but I know we need mm. it for some high volume pumping and stuff yeah. like that. But I really try and steer people away from it. But there's there's still some old hats. And they use high rise as an example, because they're like, well. I need to send 10 bar up there, so I'm going to use the pressure that I'm getting from the hydrogen. I'm like, oh, I know, I see what you're saying. That was when the pumps were a bit weaker, and this will take it all day long. You know, the, the pressure this can produce, you don't need, you don't need that anymore. Yeah. Um, but it's still trying to drag people a little bit out of that. But. It, it can depend on which service it is, because mm -hmm. there's still a variance in the tank capacity of the vehicles, Yeah. depending on the view of it. London was always traditionally, they carried the old 300 gallons. Yeah. I think it was... Lancashire was another one. I think they always had a smallish tank, mm -hmm. and most people ran with the 400 gallons yeah. of uh, water. But there's it, a spectrum there as well, because talking about compartment firefighting behaviour as, as a one example, if you are more efficient and you have a greater level of understanding of you know expansion of water and droplet sizes and blah, 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 you can be a lot more efficient, and the amount of water you actually need to put out a fire is significantly less than you think you do. Whereas we, we sometimes cause more damage to properties just through water <laughs> than the actual fire did. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is a that there's a not enough, which yeah. then has the potential to hurt someone because of steam. So yeah, that, that yeah, water yeah. immediately turns to yeah. steam. I've seen people do it where they yeah. don't use the right tool for the job. Mm. And Old terminology. Is, I need this, big water. What does that mean? You don't need that much. A thousand litre pressure? No, I did it before just some time ago where 22 mil high pressure hose was becoming popular. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that actually people necessarily understood why they were the fundamental reason for requesting it. No. Um, but of course what it does do is you can get, generally if one hose reel is you could get around over 200 litres a minute. And on your three quarter inch hose, the 19 mil, is that you were probably down more down like at 130. So there's a significant difference. It's not rocket science. It's just I've got more water than I had before. So actually I'm going to put the fire out faster. It's, yeah. You know. But again, we're talking there about what, what is becoming a a lesser part of, of the operational firefighter's role. So there's such, and, I, and I, empathize, I sympathize with them, there's such a balance between how deep do we need to take people into that training, how much do they need to know, how much do we want them to know. We want professional operators, we want professional firefighters, but we also want you to learn all of your, everything else. Yes. Else. Yeah, um, more sorry, we digress. No, that's fine. So, so yeah, so this is some of the internal workings of the CAN bus system. These are the CAN bus modules off the truck. Okay. Basically, that's when you press 999 mm -hmm. and all the blue lights come on, it's, part of that control system okay and generally speaking the programs are very similar that can are different in some functions because not everybody wants it to operate the same no the people don't control, want them to, they've got some of their yeah. own systems running in the background yeah i the, see a lot of things on fire engines are actually disabled by the services because they don't want because they don't run their own dovetail with some of the systems they're already using it's an interesting point because when i was first with the company i went to the factory and we were some vehicles we were doing it might be the initial vehicles i think we did for cornwall and one part of the requirement is and you see it quite a lot in this country is disabling the cruise control of the chassis and when we brought that up as a subject because it was in the specification to yeah. disable it the guys at the factory said can't disable it because it's the backup function if the other system fails we went okay what's that says in the standard, in 1846, yeah. that you should, and it's the same variables, there should be a backup device. So what we do is, is if the rear end packs up and you can't control the engine speed more, get in with the steering wheel and use the cruise control as the second means of uh, electronic speed control yeah, for the yeah. engine, which okay. ultimately is driving the pump. Otherwise, if the back <laughs> of the back packs up, you go, now what? Yeah. Yeah. It's not like the old days when you could do it with your shoelaces. When electronic controls came in, you know, it's got to be... It's got to be controlled electronic. The electronic side yeah. of it is an entire conversation in itself as we move into this 
crazy world of, of e-pumps. I've got an electric vehicle, but I've still got other vehicles as well because the technology's there in certain areas and certain applications, but not in others. Then there's the cost perspective. From an efficiency perspective, I imagine it will empower the vehicle to become all-encompassing, synergy efficient, talk to everything on it. Very expensive thing to try and get the sector to do, though, to move over to the... the I know we're going to look at some of the things you're working yeah. on, and I know you're, you're one of the leaders in the field. That's why I'm interested in seeing what's going on here. Yeah. Had a look at some of the you know vehicle of the month stuff that you've got on the website, but I know we'll get into that as, as we see them. I'm very, 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 very in the early learning stage of how we're trying to use that application because fire engines are expensive enough as they are, as I know you know more than anybody. Cool. It, it, is, it is an asset, obviously an expensive asset for the authorities, still has to do its job. Yep. And we all know, and we talk about it constantly, is firefighter safety. Mm -hmm. And as we know, there have been fatalities, and a, yeah. and a, a few. Mm -hmm. Too many mm -hmm. in the in last five to ten years, probably yeah. too too many. And you go, what what is it that we're doing, or what is the services doing that actually they don't actually need to do because they're putting their people at risk? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's like you just said a minute ago about some of the rules that you have. Mm -hmm. There has to some point. There's a line in the sand that says just just do that because actually that's the safest. If yeah. you start to vary and say, well, you could do this or you could do that or you could do this. What I'm always worried about, and we spoke to. Um, uh, one of the chiefs from uh, uh, New South Wales was he he always speaks about whenever there's a potential to put somebody in a risk environment he says I'll always opt to put them in a risk environment which is a sometimes an unpopular opinion but he says if you don't you can also weaken the muscle whereby if we never put people in an offensive position we're going to hemorrhage all the skill sets which means when they need to they're going to be all the more dangerous when they're in that position so he said even if there's no saveable life you know I will always try and commit breathing apparatus as a very simplistic example because he says I want people to drill the skill set I want them to be in the environment but the, we all sit somewhere on that spectrum the safest possible thing to do would never, you know, would make it all electronic and, and drones and whatever. We never yeah. put another person in that environment again. I don't think that's where we want to go. I think it's a, it's a lovely dreamland for in terms of safety um, and the safer firefighter concept. But we're still going to need those skill set. We're I, never going to fully remove. Uh, no, I no, I hundred percent agree. Yeah. And I think the and there's so many subconscious variables that you viscerally pick up from having that, you know, like books like Bounce and the ten thousand hour rule and stuff like that you condition yourself to realize in things that AI is probably still a long way away from conceptually understanding what needs to be done at an incident. There's still a lot of human factors that we yeah. can't, can't factor for. Yeah, because we have our feet in several distinct camps of firefighting, mm. so municipals, we'll call it for local authorities, aviation, mm -hmm. industrial. Now, what do those three things do the same job yes not <laughs> on quite, paper not quite on paper <laughs> yeah not quite the same because no. there's different rules for different things so yeah. we've had incidents in this country haven't we so take Buntsfield as a yep. example that's on fire okay what we're we going to do with it easy tiger we've got to wait hello have you got any foam concentrate yeah you've got to gather your resources for an incident like that before you attack it otherwise you're completely wasting your time the other flip side of that is aviation industry what's the aviation firefighters role mm -hmm. there's a plane on fire Go and put it out as fast as possible. Fast as possible. Yeah. yeah. And then the all guns blazing. Yeah. Go, go, go. Yep, go. Speed and volume. And then the municipals sit somewhere, probably I would say between the between the two. Yeah. Depending because your incident types, whilst in aviation and industrials, their incidents are different, but they're based on the same thing. You could you could go to a bus garage, a block of flats, a terraced house, a bungalow, or yeah, we we, we we all know, and you know, a lot of firefighters in this country have been abroad or into Europe, where they see what other people are doing. Yeah. And you go to a fire station in Europe, and you stand at one end, and you go, "Look at all them fire engines." <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got one of these, one of that, one of this, one of them. We've got the almost the one size fits all fire engine because yeah. that's the way our model works, mm -hmm. and that's how our budget I th works. I think there's a Yes, I appreciate the budgetary constraints, but I read a really interesting book from James Dyson. I don't know if you've read it. He released it, I think, maybe last year or the year before. And he said one of the, one of the most fantastic things we have in the UK is uh, our mechanical engineering and, and our engineers in, mm. as a whole. And the fact that what we export now really is a lot of mm. knowledge. And it's similar with the military when you think mm. about the smart soldier and the fact that... Yeah. You haven't got one person to load the gun, one person to aim it, one person to shoot it. Mm. We do all of it, not just because people thought we're small, you haven't got mm. enough money. We've learned those lessons and we're actually a lot further along in, in the, sort of the innovative cycle that we can still tick all of those boxes. We just don't need seven different vehicles. We can do it with probably the same you thing, could, yeah, you, with the greatest respect. No, but if you look you, at it yes. simply from a lens, you go, 
Oh, surely they, they must be far better. They've got lots more vehicles. Yeah, but they've only got one crew, so they can only be on one of them at once. Uh, absolutely <laughs> is like that. I mean, I've been in fire stations in Europe, and the, and the alarm goes off, and, you get, and, a, and an ambulance flies out the door. Yeah. So it's not a fire instance at all. No, exactly. But the two guys are gone with it anyway. <laughs> and yes, there is that argument that says, you know, it's a bit unnecessary to have all these types, but they can do it. So one of our colleagues in Austria, he's a chief of his town, yeah. and he has several different vehicles. He's got, you know, D-mounts, and he's got yeah. a forest firefighting vehicle, and a, he's got a rail vehicle. Mm -hmm. He's got a Bronto Sky lift and so on so he's got all those different vehicles does he really need them uh, possibly not he does have a risk with a petroleum uh, storage facility yeah, close by is our one size fit all fire engine in the uk the right thing for everybody probably not is it 80 percent successful yes we always have sector specialists we always have specialist yeah. advisors when we go yeah. to a hazmat yeah. we go to a rail yeah. incident yeah. so mm. And in the same respect, we need a vehicle to facilitate mm. that. It needs to be yeah. a toolbox. Yeah. Um, and I'm conscious of this when we look at things like Grenfell and, and High Rise Instance. How many people will run, run out there and knee jerk? And this may be an unpopular thing. For, oh, well, we all need Bronco Skylift. You know, we all need a, an aero ladder platform. Yeah. I appreciate that's what your community may think they want. Mm. Show me what your tool buildings and or high rise risk profile is. Because I'll sell you them all day long, absolutely. But that's the beautiful thing about Rosenbauer is what, let me understand what you think you need and then I can show you a variety of what we've got. Yeah, I'm in the find the solution camp. Yes. Often in our industry, if the customer says, I don't know what I want, it throws the industry into a little bit of a proxy and goes, well, I don't know what, if I don't know what you want, I don't know what to give you. Yeah. I'm in the, oh, you don't know what you want. Okay, what is it you want to do? Yeah. What's the things so that the you want to, to do? Yeah. And let me see if I can come up with a solution yeah. to, to give you some. I look at this when, um, so I'm part of the UK International Search and Rescue, and we have a logistics team from London, from LFB. Um, we always go to them and tell them what we've got, because they've got a myriad of kit. They've got so much stuff, but they might not have the thing. You might be used to working with a certain brand, and you go yeah. and ask them, I've got one of them. Just tell them what you're trying to do. Yeah, you so well, I'm trying to do a stitch cut, or I'm shoring in this area, I'm doing that. And they go, right, okay, let me get you the breaker, you know, the, the yep. timber shore, whatever you need, the tool you need to do that job. Just tell what you're trying to achieve, and then yeah. I'll tell you what yeah. you need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a case of, I mean, I've had it before, where people have said, you know, sit in a room with some firefighters, and they go, that's not what we want. And I have said to them, don't say that again. Can you say, I need, not we don't want. It's not what you don't want. It's what is it you need to do your job with, and then I'm going to try and find you the piece. I have this on such a micro scale with. With, with my wife, when she'll say, <clears throat> Uh, are, you, uh, are you busy on Friday? Yeah, I'm, I'm always busy. Okay, yeah. what do you want to do? Yeah, and then I'll, we'll work together yeah. to try and find a slot in the diary. If you say, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sitting around waiting for you to task me, yeah. Yeah. let's go and do an exciting yeah. thing. I'll thank yeah. God because I was going to sit yeah. here for nine hours and nothing yeah. to do. You tell me what yeah. you want to do, yeah. and then we'll, we'll find yeah. a way to yeah. do it. If you yeah. say, I want to go to a yeah. family day out, I'll yeah. go, great, February 12th, let's go there that's at 2 a.m., you know, 2 p.m., sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but, tell me what you're yeah. trying to achieve. Otherwise, yeah. it's a, such a longer, expensive conversation. No, yeah, no, no, and I'll, I'll you know, bring 50 different samples yeah, of products well, down and you don't, you don't really know what you want to try to achieve. What, what's, the, what's the worst thing I can do? Is sell someone something that I know isn't what they need to do their job with. And yeah. then when they get it, they go, well, well that didn't do what we think of it. And you go, yeah. oh, so bad luck. Yeah, or it was yeah, over-engineered, yeah. it was far too big, you it was, don't, it was well, far I too don't whatever. Want to be in that. And I do, we do decline stuff and go, oh, listen, I don't want to get involved in that. You're not quite sure what you want, and you're yeah. only going to say something bad about the thing yeah. I give you that doesn't do what you think you wanted to do, but you didn't know what you wanted to do. No. So then you go, oh, they didn't really listen to us. I, I had a conversation with someone, I had a conversation well. with someone uh, recently, not in this country, um, English-speaking guy, and he said, we want a pickup to do this, that, and the other with. I went, well, you don't want a pickup then, do you? And he went, yes, we want a pickup. I went, no, you don't want a pickup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What you've just described to me is not a pickup truck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. We walk past this, but it's a new piece of kit. This is the car battery fire extinguishing. Wow. Okay. That's out. interesting because there's several answers to how people are trying to solve that. We just had a specialist from the US on right. talking about how to extinguish Teslas and things like that as right. one single example. So this is actually sitting in a box that we've made, so it actually sits in that box. But anyway, so at the minute we're going to we've been making a rig, okay. and it's likely to be a rolling scrap car of some sort, so we can pierce the floor and show people. So that's the control unit. Mm -hmm. has two compressed air cylinders in the back of it and basically you slide it under the car get it ready and then press control button 
and here's a hardened piercing tip in there, which has got some holes in it. That looks scary. Yeah, it's a bit scary. <laughs> when it goes off, we'll, yeah, we'll win. Oh, that's a bit scary. Yeah. So pierce the battery compartment. Yeah, because yeah. a lot of them is the turn, entire then turn the water, of the Then car, turn the water supply on. Some people have got some very inefficient, expensive ways of doing it. I don't know what the companies are, but we've seen some people have to bury them. Some people are dropping them in entire baths of water, bath water and water taking them away. And yeah. I'm like, mm. how we did not think about this? And because mm. and we're all so busy, the communication links between perhaps companies such as yourselves or mm. even just fire sectors and the people mm. that are producing these mm. things are going on the road. You're like, we need to talk to each other. What's, well, <laughs> how did we get to this point and we haven't had a solution? We're now chasing our tail, aren't we? We were, we were at an airport last week and we were showing them the Panther was what we were doing. And of course, then we're talking to talk about other stuff that we'd got and remarks about this. And airports are very interested in what this is doing. And then said airport had also got a cold cutting device. And they were saying, well, actually, we think, you know, that's, we've been told we can cut into battery compartments. And I went, I think you ought to be a little bit careful with all those iron filings that are Yeah, 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 I yeah. know the system you're on about. Uh, and, and that might not be what you really want to do yeah. with a battery compartment. But also the logistics of trying to get to it, like you said, something like this, you can <coughs> slide underneath it. With the model that we might be alluding to, hmm. I'm thinking you're going to have no, to fully there. invert the vehicle to be able to you to punch through the bottom of that. that yeah. Uh, yeah. whatever lance type yeah. thing is not going to get under there to do that you're going to no. put somebody at a great deal no. of danger you know, having, having, used, get so, that having used that device myself you know the limitation of you know it's yeah. very good it's good at punching through a wall so the, yeah that's the latest and we will be doing awesome. some demonstrations and stuff Love like that, that. In the a quick update from one of our partners and we'll be right back to the show. Today's episode was brought to you by our partner, William Wood Watches. Now in support of the firefighters charity, William Wood Watches, who are the makers of those beautiful luxury watches from upcycled firefighting equipment, are bringing you the always ready motorcycle. It's super essential to make you aware of this one, folks, because there are only 300 tickets available. William Wood Watches have partnered with a talented Sultan Motorcycles and they're bringing you the first William Wood Watches motorcycle. This is incorporating the workings of all of their watches and adorned with multiple elements of upcycled firefighting materials. This is a one-off motorcycle and it's like nothing you've ever seen before. It can only be won if you're in the prize draw. You can enter the prize draw if you follow the link in the post below this episode. All profits raised from the sale of the Always Ready Motorbike will be donated to the Firefighters Charity in the UK supporting firefighters and their families. Not only does making a purchase from William Wood Watches mean you will get your hands on one of those beautiful and authentic luxury pieces of firefighting nostalgia, but you will be supporting this effort and giving a donation to the people that operate in our sector. Now back to the show. What have we got here? So this is our demo vehicle. This mm -hmm. is a Rosenbauer compact line. There are different versions of these mm -hmm. about, and this is one of the better ones. Mm. Part of the reason for that is it's limited what you can do with the truck with a chassis like this. So it's a sprinter. So five tons. That's same. The, the truth is the same with any vehicle. There is always a it's capacity. A limit. It's always a limit. The problem is when Absolutely. you're going down versus, yeah. versus up, people go, oh God, got to get rid of some stuff. There's stuff yeah. on that vehicle we haven't used in 10 years. Uh, you, know, Absolutely. you can get rid of some So use it for the intended purpose. They're very popular. All compact line vehicles are built at a factory in Neidling, which is between our main plants in Linz okay. and Vienna. And what this vehicle does have is when we were talking about that pump earlier, mm -hmm. it's fitted with the high pressure pump only. Because mm. the, there's a PTO on here, which is limited. You have to put an oil cooler on to get 40 kilowatts. Okay. And you get 34 bar on the high pressure pump. So you can do gas cooling with okay. it, which I is mean, part of the attraction. We said it about 32 for the greatest efficiency, I think it was our 19 mil hose. They used <coughs> to preset to 25 or 28, yeah. but then we used to dial them up. 32 because that's what's most it's efficient for your gas cooling. It's, it's one of the things that we've done recently is that um, with people when they've gone to 22 mil hose mm -hmm. we can run the pump slower because yep. the inlet pressure at the branch is the real thing you're really interested in people seem to forget about that and because the, the way the pump is working mm -hmm. and the 22 mil hose mm -hmm. you don't still need 25 bar at the pump yeah. because you'll get still getting an inlet yeah. pressure of 15 yeah. or whatever so it is that you would have. So yeah, you don't need, you can slow the engine down, save fuel and noise and what have yeah. you, but still get the same inlet pressure at the branch because you've now got 22 millos. What I like about this vehicle is, well, so from a personnel perspective, one of the big uh, concerns that we see some people talking about is the fact that it can no longer fit four people. If you give me a smaller vehicle, you're expecting me to ride around with two. This and, and some of the other vehicles you have, how many do we see in here? So I think this is, could be set for four. It would be it a does tight look set for four. squeeze. And I think some of the ones well, we've had. In fact, there's five, six, 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 six
Yeah, so you've got six and so There you go, exactly the same as most of our engines are. Yep. The concern with a smaller vehicle mm. for some people is that are oh, you going to force us to go down to less personnel? Yeah. And this is a. Uh, you quite see it's quite common that some of the trucks you see that are actually going to Germany or Austria when you see them is that it might not have a water tank, which is really alien to us. Mm. It's just another one. It'll carry a portable pump, might carry one of our Fox pumps, for instance, yeah. and then a load of equipment. And then they, they go to a lake or something or a river or something and they'll use it, won't mm. have a tank. But I mean, this truck's got seating for six, but it's got a 500 litre water tank as well. Imagine. It's using that high pressure. What's this under? It's a Mercedes uh, Sprinter. Sprinter. It's a okay. Sprinter, yeah. So it's a four, four by two. So that's rear wheel drive. Wow, it's still over. You no, might not have noticed straight away. No suction. Crikey, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so we are going straight tank fill here, so which is nice. So straight tank fill, because actually it's a 500 litre tank. And you, but you can, you can have a, we have done one of these with, yep. um, with a suction inlet for open water supply. So okay. yeah, there are limits to, as you said, every vehicle has a limit of some mm -hmm. sort. And the smaller yeah. the vehicle, the, the lower the but limit. But we've still got a nine, mm -hmm. nine metre on top, is it? Uh, seven metre. Seven metre? Just seven okay. metre. That's the irony. Mm -hmm. yeah, I always say to people, how many times in, uh, in anger have you used a 13.5 in your career? Very few. Yeah, I mean, you go once, yeah. I think I've maybe done it three or four times over 15 years. Most of the time, you just ask to do it when a dignitary of some form comes to the station to get the 13.5 out for a four-man pitch. Anyway. So, because we're building on something we buy, it's a truck. It's a bit of story. <laughs> <coughs> but it does have things to do it. So, for instance, so this is a Scania, one of the latest models. There are new ones coming out again, so they've upgraded yeah. it. It's an 18-tonner, so it sits on these whacking great big wheels. Because of the way it's been designed with these rear axles and that size of tyre, yeah. this, this tyre wall here, as you can see, is pretty level with the outside of the truck. Yep. If we make this truck any wider, <coughs> it would actually be illegal. Illegal? It would. It's a strong because word. Because these, these, there's a maximum width for HGV vehicles okay. in this country, road going. With special permission, we do drive the Panther on the road, with <laughs> special permission because it's three metres wide. But because these, the, these vehicles in particular, this tyre wall is mm -hmm. pretty much on the maximum legal width. You've got to keep everything more or less within sort of it. So it's the maximum yeah. legal width of a truck. If the, if the tyres start getting any wider, they've got this right there, and the truck guys go, well, that's what it is, bad luck. You go, oh, okay, that's a bit tricky. Yeah. <laughs> what, what do I do with this? Because with air suspension, if you put your fingers along here, your fingers are very thin. Okay. Oh, crikey, yeah. And that's because when the air suspension goes down, it's got to miss that, and it misses it. Yeah, things again that are specific to our sector because the HGV drivers, I don't need to drop the back, I've just got a thing if I want to unload my stuff here, but we need to get the ladder off the top well, or we the, might need this to is, pump this out the, over the, water. The, 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 rear, the suspension unit on the rear is, back in the day when you first started to see it, it's called a ferry lift and it, that describes it in its nutshell. It is, for a goods vehicle, getting on a ferry at a low or high tide Yeah. because the ramp to the ferry varies depending on the tide. Ah, so with the back end of the truck, you know what, drag I bet up. you repeat that somewhere. Drag I'm up. certainly going <laughs> to back yeah. pocket that uh, one. <laughs> yeah, so I might drag the truck up the ramp because the ramp's in a yeah. different position. And you only need it to happen three or four times before the boss goes, getting bored of this, fellas, it's expensive. And, <laughs> All right. and, uh, you know, there was always a thing Scotland always used to have, I don't know if they still have it, was underneath there'll be some shackles. Okay. Because if they're taking vehicles backwards and forwards yeah. to the islands, yeah. they want to be able to lash it to the deck of the ferry. I know it's something we're going to get into, but for people that are, are listening, you obviously used to do a lot of work with the Dennis's, so yeah. you're one of those rarities Still, that has yeah, actually yeah. got knowledge in it, has not transitioned <laughs> from another no. sector and gone, yeah. I'm going to run this company. Well, you don't really understand no. what we're doing here. No, so when you buy, you go, okay, so, so for instance, if someone comes out with a tender and then what, what do you, what you look at straight away, I tend to look at the dimensions. Yeah. Then I look at the weights yeah. because they're the really important things. And then Do you ever have really concerning submissions where there's no dimensions on it at all? I ask normally. So you go, you know, are there any dimensional constraints? You can play, you can play that game where you don't ask, and when you get the order later today, you go, by the way, we've got any dimensional constraints, which yeah. is not great, because they go, oh, yeah. yeah. That's a bit of an analogy where someone says, well, you know, we just want something that squirts water. Well, an elephant squirts water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it ain't one of these, is it? You know? So this is a Rosenbauer AT, and we're unusual in the fact that what we're building on is a, is a day cab, a day cab from Scania, and our cab is part of the superstructure. Now, there's a join between the front cab and the back cab. There's something between, between a camper van and a fire engine. That just screams comfort to me. Any other comfort and safety. The subframe of the superstructure is coming up as almost as far forward as we can get it. So what happens is it's, it's, it's stiffening the chassis rails. Wow. The superstructure, because of the way the superstructure is manufactured, 
so it's a, it's a rectangle. Yeah. The roof of the AT is made of a composite honeycomb board like an aeroplane. Okay. And all bonded and bolted together. So this yeah. monocoque now is really, really stiff. Bolted to the chassis. A bit of flexibility in it because you can't have it rigid, rigid. No. But what happens is, not so much on a Scania because the chassis is quite rigid anyway. On a, on a, say, a Volvo that's a 16 ton, the chassis tend to be lighter. This will stiffen the chassis. You start to lose traction yeah. on the road or you start to go into a bit of an oversteer or an understeer moment yeah. on the truck you will find out earlier on this vehicle than you on another vehicle because the chassis is so stiff you start to lose contact with the ground and you can feel it if you start ah. to you can feel it more because on a conventional one with a double cab yeah the subframe will come to there back here and, that and what happens at that moment between the cab because that's generally where the locks are yeah. and the front of the bodybuilder's subframe is the chassis moves twists like yeah, this. But as a driver you won't get that feedback. No, it catches you out. Yeah. So I've got a video I can show you, right? <laughs> which is an extreme version. Yeah. It's, cause guy, it's on a test ground and the, as the driver turns you see the cab start to turn and the body doesn't until much later when it's actually quite extreme yeah. and what you turn the chassis rails into is a torsion spring. And then eventually it goes, eventually. I don't really want to Whips. do that. Yeah. And that's how, it, that's how a rollover happens most times. Ah because the chassis goes, well, I'm not doing that, and whip you over. That must be a strange, uh, a quite, feel quite <coughs> surreal for the, uh, I suppose they don't notice it too much, for the people sitting in the rear cab. Yeah, one of the it things. It's like a much nicer talk through, though, versus some of the other vehicles. Yep. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? God, there's so much bloody room in here. So no breathing apparatus on this one. So well, not in the internal, not in part of the cab, or on the it's vehicle. In, it's, in the, it's on the body. It's, it's in the, it's in the body, yeah. yep. And. I think that's safer though, you know when we look, talk about um, carrying back all the hard carbons, people not washing their kit, firefighter yeah. safety, and you're sitting in here and you're putting sets on that have still got all of that you know, ceiling that's fallen down and sat in the straps and you think you're in a place of safety or we're away from it now and we're right. stripping off I and mean, everything's still gassing off. This, this should be a clean area, this cab, yeah. and it's, mm. historically it's not been. The things we used to throw in here, yeah. well, I'll just throw it in the cab, we'll wash it when we get back. Yeah. All right, where are we going to be sitting? Yeah. We never thought about it. No. But... Speakers and oh, little, nice. little, little microphones. Because I can never hear, we've got, we've got some girls on our team, they're so quiet, bless them. I can yeah. never hear a sodding no. thing sat no. in the front. I really have to no. shout at them. I say, my big ears face forwards. You need to shout at me from the back because yeah. I no. can't hear you. No. I'm just going to give you instructions, but I don't know what you're saying. No. Perfect. Love it. Yeah. Just a quick reminder of our monthly giveaway with our partner Hikes and Tallyman. If you jump over to our social media platforms, you can once again get a chance to win a pair of Hikes Black Eagle Adventure GTX boots. Hikes is one of the biggest and best brands in the boot market and now supplies armies around the world, equipping special units, firefighters, paramedics, police officers when it comes to high quality, high tech footwear. And from our partner Tallyman, you can get two personalized BA tallies with your name on them and the logo of the podcast on the back. Just head over to our social media channels and all the instructions are there you got to scroll through find the post and get on it now back to the show you know we were talking about the pump earlier so this one has got a rosenbauer nh35 3000 liters a minute it's rated at open water so a three meter lift however from the pump tank suction into the pump 4000 liters a minute why is that okay. well because i'm sucking it from three meters am i i've got this great big head of water in this tank makes the pump more efficient this is a unique design, this bit here, it's a Rosenbauer item. The water access. Okay. So where's my pressure supply? Where's my tank fill? There it is, one thing. And also, you can use it from an open supply as well. So you can fill the tank, have a pressure supply, or suck from open water through this one device. Yeah, less confusion for people that aren't sure where to put things. You open yep. the back and there's seven yep. different entry ports yep. and they're not sure where to yep. plug it in. Yep. Because the Rosenbauer pump is running slower, because what we are talking about earlier about the amount of, because the performance curve is shallow. It's quite quiet anyway. It's even quieter with that on there. So an acoustic cover on it. And there's this 200 litre foam tank. We can stop start at the back. So it's one of our features that we do anyway. So stop, you can do everything. You don't need to do anything. So, you know, you pull up at your job, come around yeah. here, you can press. So you press start, it'll engage the PTO. Ah, so you don't have to worry about you've forgotten to do something. You don't have to. And no. run back and go, where is no. it? Is it in the middle on this one or is it a button on the yeah. side somewhere? Yeah. The, a feature of this vehicle yeah. is you can also do that. You're not getting rained on either. You're not getting rained on under there. <laughs> Correct. And actually, there was a picture actually that uh, Surrey gave us a few weeks ago, one of their other vehicles. All of their older ones. It. They were. <laughs> I <Yeah>. love it. <laughs> so, on the roof. Oh, wow. What's that? Is a Rosenbauer RM15 remote control monitor. So very much an echo of the uh, airport. Correct. Where you see the huge cannons on top. There it is, sorry. But that's really useful. 
it's very useful. And so, when you're traveling around um, um, spots with all the little hot spots and you see some of the wildfires and stuff like that, I bet that's tremendously useful. They have, they've used it in quite a number of different applications. Surrey has one of the longest stretches of the M25, which have truck fires, quite ready. Mm -hmm. And to be able to pull up, on these vehicles, you can pump and roll. Really? What happens is, if it's done correctly, so like the roof mounted monitor, you can pump and roll, it will not change gear. Okay, yep. So it limits you, the driver's ability to rev the engine too hard and create different changes of pressure, yeah. which so you're going to be doing it at speed anyway. Yeah, you often see it with, uh, with people who've got like Land Rovers or pickups or something for Heath fires, mm -hmm. but they've got a pressure unit of some sort. It's entirely and separate they walk unit, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's yeah, the cool. capacity of it? So you can do around up to about 2,000 litres a minute or slightly more than that. Really? Out of there. Wow, okay. I thought but you were going to, I thought we were talking hosier numbers. No, or you can, lower. you can have a half flow setting, which is always is a standard option. So you've got your four and a half thousand litres of water tank. How long do you want to run that for? Mm -hmm. Becomes the question. You know, do you want to make it last as long as you can? Say, do a thousand litres a minute, and the control is in the cabin. Okay. So that's hence the reason for having is it a 180 PTO. degree window, or is it? Uh, no, it's limited. For, I think it'll come almost around 90 degrees either side of the centre. It won't go backwards. No, but that's what I mean. So it's got yeah, a it's all this field. Degree yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. And so you, you almost quite it backwards. And see no, what you're doing you anyway. can engage and operate it from so in the cabin. That's great. Stick. So there'll be the control screen there. There's, oh, there's the stick. It's got a joystick. Of course yeah. it has. God, that's great. And even yeah. the driver, if obviously when he's not moving, or yep. she, sorry, can, uh, can operate it. I come from my background originally was of engineering. So back in the day when I was a draftsman, get your blank bit of paper out. What's the first thing you draw on your piece of paper? You draw the top of the chassis. Okay. That's the thing, first thing you draw. Then you draw where your axles are. And then generally speaking, you would then draw where the back of the cab comes and go, right, what am I going to do now? size of the wheels and then you find out where the ground is. I oh, don't forget, you know, back in the day when I first started, I did actually work on vehicles that had a wheel escape. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but they go, this ladder has got to sit here and particularly these days, the heel of this ladder has got to be this far off the ground. So now I've got a chassis rail and I've got a ladder. What can I do between that and that? And it's limited, it's constrained. The design the window, is constrained by something. Yeah. So because the AT is, you know, the body works high, mm -hmm. same height as the cab, Mm -hmm. So when the truck ain't any bigger than the normal fire engine, in fact in some ways it's a bit lower because we haven't got a ladder perched up. Yeah. The roof is flat because it's part of that construction I was telling you about earlier to stiffen the chassis rails and there's a compartment in there to put water tanks in. What size water tank do you want mm -hmm. becomes the question. It's so a long overhead, so I know you've got some hard suction. Yep. Is that, are they all hard suction? Those are all hard there, suction. So we've that got... Runs the entire length of the rear body. Yes, because there is three lengths, I think, of five and a half inch suction. Okay. And then we've got two lengths of four inch for a portable pump. How's that? And then we have some behemoths in front of us. And then we have some behemoths in front of us. So <laughs> um, usually Rosenbauer has a product, most sorts made by Rosenbauer. Uh -huh. The ladders that we're standing around, as you can see is written on the front of the, or the floor of the cage, it says METS. Yep. Rosenbauer bought Mets Ladder Company in 1998. Kept it as Mets for quite a long time, and we still put Mets on it. But it's Rosenbauer Karlsruhe now, where aerials are made, ladders and ALPs. So, so is it just, not merely, but the authenticity of keeping the name because they've got Correct. such a history such a history of yeah. you know, what they're doing in that sector? Yeah. It'd be silly of you to throw it out um, if your yeah. ego allowed you to want to put Rosenbauer over everything, but no, yeah. you, you acknowledge the wealth of knowledge they brought to it, I suppose. Yeah. Because we're Absolutely. sort of standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of people that have come yeah. up with this stuff to mm. start with. And we even have uh, background music for interviews as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very well done, eh? <laughs> And we were talking about a lot of them obviously have proximity sensors, but given that uh, services can sometimes position their ladder platforms above something to give them an aerial uh, advantage. Yep. Mm. They, do they have, I'm guessing they don't, they must don't have any thermal detection. Uh, ALPs uh, do, okay. uh, and generally it's sensing off the boom, um, okay. whereas the ladders don't. Well, there'll always be a manual override for people to ignore that and <laughs> put, yes. it, put it in a position where yes. it shouldn't be. Yes, absolutely. Again, like it's there, always like just when you meet the limit of any of the aerial operating things, you know. I don't know if you What's that buzzer? Switch it so, off. So you can, it will tell you, on the screen, I'm, I'm in a, I can operate them, I'm a bit of a novice. Yeah. So you've got your foot on the switch, yeah. and you get to the maximum outreach that's going to let you do it. Outside your window thing, now. And you go, yep. yeah, but I really need to get to that window. Override it. You, it's your conscious decision to go, I need to go another meter to that window. Yeah. 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 So that's what yeah. I'm going to do. 
And you want to still allow some of that freedom because the, the boots on the ground will have a different interpretation of risk and capability and what yeah. they're trying to do and how long they're going to be doing it for, but it can can still go wrong sometimes. Yeah, them. I mean, there are on the aerials, you know, several new modern features. The ladders now have a, they're on a level of software, which is the latest software, gives us a bit more outreach. Mm -hmm. The Rosenbauer Nets ladder. A lot of these can reach, some people, and I know it's probably very common knowledge to some of the listeners, but you can also go beneath Correct. where you are. Yes. Which Absolutely. a lot of people aren't aware of. You can, yeah, can for be. example, park yep. beside a yes. river and you can. You know, so on a, a on, rescue on, like that. Uh, so the difference between an ALP and a <clears> ladder, so a lot of people will go, oh, which one do I want? So on the ladder, you could park next to a canal bank, river bank, or a motorway embankment, yep. for instance, and I want to go down that slope, pull up with a ladder, set the jacking system, and the whole side of the vehicle, you can tip it on its yeah. side and point the ladder downhill. Yeah, okay. that scared me the first time. Because I saw you it. don't have to have the bed level. No. Yeah. So the gimbal on the ladder set will still let you do 180, 360 degrees of rotation, yeah. even if the bed is like this, because the gimbal will keep the ladder straight. People just look at them and simply think this is a method of going up as high as you possibly yeah. can. And it's, it's an important thing to talk about because I think a lot of people are unaware yeah, of it. They are. So the, we have some B45 aerial ladder platforms coming, and on the B45 is a telescopic fly boom and it gives us eight meters below ground. Wow, okay. I thought it was five, the old ones. Five, wasn't it, yeah. One of the things is if you start to get a much bigger aerial, for instance, the mass of it is much bigger. We've had a conversation with a few people that have and smashed them through floors outside of big high-rise buildings because these things get so big and heavy the infrastructure of the location where they're going to be used. So yeah. whilst you get your ground pressure reading on the jacks when you pitch it, so a ladder, for instance, once you've got ground pressure, you can pitch it. It doesn't matter what the angle of the ground underneath it is. Okay. An ALP, self-level it, you've got ground pressure, you're, you're good to go. If you've got a massive one that, say, like these B45s are, they'll be 25 tonnes you know, on a 26-tonne chassis, so they're fairly heavy. Yeah. If you get them on a serious slope of any sort, there's a distinct chance it might move <laughs> because the sheer weight yeah. of the unit is yeah. on a slope. Yeah. And it's only the friction between the plates, even if you're using the boards, there is things. So could you pitch on a steeper the slope on a repose, smaller isn't unit? It yeah. 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 You yeah. use so, it with slump with cement yeah. and stuff like that. Absolutely. So you, yeah, absolutely, is it? Yeah. At, so, a so, point, so, at a certain point, it's still going point, to it's move. It's still going to move. <laughs> so can you pitch a smaller unit on a steeper hill? Yes, you can because the mass is lower. Bigger's not always better. Yeah, bigger's yeah. not always better. How barrages. much of your market is made up of airports, civil aviation and stuff like that versus local authority and where does the balance sit? Because obviously a lot of airport services and stuff like that don't, don't sit under government, it's effectively private organisation. Again, you talked about constraints. Yep. Where's the percentage? How much of a voice do they have? It's a, not a great question, I'm not wording it in a very good way, but if you could navigate me through that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, as you rightly say, the, there is a split between some airports are actually owned by local authorities. Mm. And some and are American would be, Air would be a smaller, and yeah, there'll be and There was some time ago, it was, I was really only got exposed to the aviation market when I came to Rosenbauer from my previous it's job. It's a political minefield and, versus the And some service. of them, that at one time, there was a lot of the airports were part of the same group, but they were told to divide up by the things like monopolies commission or oh, something yeah, yeah. and because they owned because it was you know they were they were demanding well, the land, they so much power like landing in, fees and stuff yeah. like that so there's a whole tirade of who they're owned by so Heathrow is like for instance is an organization on its own mm, that's um, what i mean yeah and so you deal with the people that they may have procurement at the airports they may not have the procurement at the airport so we've got three of these for instance near where i live at farnborough airport okay farnborough airport is pretty much private private jets only in there, you know, they have about 80 <laughs> to 100 movements a day, which is actually quite a lot for a small airfield, but it's a big airfield. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's history, the Farnborough airfield. But it has three of these parts in there for small, for small jets. And then just up the road is Heathrow, just around the corner is Gatwick. And, you know, near where I live, it's, you know, there's a whole load of, you know, Luton, Stansted, uh, what's the London, shelf London City. Like this? I know they have a big service in plan. And uh, they plan. always quote 15, but generally I would say it was more than that. It was you're more likely to see, you know, you can see some pretty ancient. Yeah. Vehicles probably in excess of 20 years old on some yeah. of these. Some I think of these you see airfields. that a lot of vehicles, though. You know, mm. vehicles of old didn't last. Now, mm. you can have 100, 200,000 miles on a vehicle, and it's still good to go for another 10 years because they're just that much better, better made these days. Yeah, they're they, really? built for the purpose. For instance, I always, if someone said to me, it was like that MAN chassis that's there for 
that ladder, yeah. someone says something about extended warranty on the kingpins, and it was born out of on the old Dennis's mm. where the kingpins used to wear out like fairly quickly. It was okay. the way the axle was built and set up because it was it was a fire engine. But these are like, you know, there's a warranty of like 3,000, 300,000 kilometres or something. It's yeah. like, you know what? You know, and that's because it's a truck yeah. and it's been designed. It's been, you know, it's yeah, been tested yeah, yeah. and thing. And it's been, you know, the mileage has yeah. been, and, that, and that's how they rate them. Like, you know, the rest of the vehicle's probably going to fall apart long before <coughs> they're ever... You do so see it. Yeah. If, you, if we were at the factory where the Panthers uh, built, you'd see the design philosophy for the production line. Okay. If you turn the clock back 15 years, I'm not exaggerating it, the fact that there'll be a bloke in a factory, in a building like this, with a hacksaw in his hand and saying to the customer, so how long do you want it? <laughs> and it and literally there could be as hand-built as that. I mean, they're hand-built. Don't forget, someone's got to assemble it, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, but there's hand-building and there's hand-assembling. is a completely different thing. And so there are, dotted around, you know, what's probably were the second most, in the past, what's the second most common airfield crash tender you see? I'll be a Carmichael. And actually, were they a good truck? Yeah, they were, actually. But yeah. they were what they were. This is a bit of a step up from what yeah. Carmichael were doing. But that, you know, 15 years has lapsed past. It's such an interesting manufacturer. I used to work in fast-moving consumer goods as a mm. Kaiser Six Sigma um, mm. continuous improvement uh, manager when I was there. Mm. And because you did so much mass, it, it became a very different process in terms of waste and efficiency and TRS and all this sorts of stuff. Whereas you're never, you're never making thousands of these, so there's always going to be out of the 100% manufacturing process, there's always going to be 34%, which is going to become bespoke to the end user because we're not making a thousand, or sorry, a million Ford Focuses, we're making 50. So it always gets cheaper on mass, but there's a, yes. there's a spectrum there. And the people who don't know anything about it might go, why is it, why is it so expensive versus you know, how much it is to make a Ford Focus? Surely it's not that much more complex. And go, well, there's, there's, there's a, it's a, it's a massive market, but it's by comparison, it's still a significantly smaller market it's a significantly than a, smaller market than than a, a commercial than a vehicle. Yeah. You know, it's, mm. it's a whole different... You, it looks as yeah. though it's in the same sector. It's not at all, yeah. Yeah. really. No, if you like, so I think <laughs> since 2015, this model, we've supplied over 2,000 worldwide. Mm. Yeah. That's a lot. But it's, it's but a it's, lot, but, but it doesn't sound like a lot. People go, really? Oh, is that no, a lot? Oh, yeah. thought you were one of the industry yeah. leaders. Yeah. Well, we are. We are. That is, yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. That yeah. is a lot. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. No, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. Totally and different. Because the factory does run lean manufacturing in that, and they did yeah, do lean. an exercise a couple of years ago, particularly where the pumps are. So they completely decimated how the pumps were put together and the places they put together, and they've now done that, that like you said, is the pump's here to be assembled, Here's the tools to do the job with. On your shadow board in the and that, there, yeah. And that you only have the tools on the station that you do the yeah, job with. Yeah, you don't yeah, need any other yeah, tools to do yeah. it with. And the production lines are very, very similar. I can't miss all that. And so there's a bit of commonality between each of these models of Panthers. So, yeah. for instance, are the axles the same? Yes, they are. Can they have different sized tyres? Yeah, they can, depending on which model it is. Is that cabin the same? Yes, it is. Is the Atrit unit, the Stinger unit on the roof the same? Yes, it is, unless it's a 16.5 or a 20 metre version. Okay. Most commons are 16.5 metres. What size is the water tank? Well, that might vary, because it will vary as to whether it's got the Atrit on it or not, so you can carry more weight, because the limiting factor is the tyres. Is it really? On any truck, there's always a weight limit on the tyres. No, 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 yeah, regardless of what truck it any, is. But... Yep. And again, so it shows my is is a massive yeah. void of knowledge. Yeah. yeah. It looks like a big tank, have, for God's sake. It looks fairly bulletproof. Yeah, and because of the use of the truck, yeah. there's Michelin permission to use it at a higher rate okay. and higher speed because it's intermittent. If it was a truck going up and down the motor, they wouldn't let you do it. No. At the speed you want to do it. Yeah. So we are on the limit of the tyres, but we're only speeding down the runway to an aircraft, aren't we? Yeah. A minute and a half later, we're there. The Firefighters Podcast was created to be a global podcast seeking to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator. Through a series of wide-ranging conversations, we celebrate those within our emergency services family and the wider sector by encouraging the support of these incredible group of people who have chosen to make their life purpose protecting their communities and the wider society. It's presented by myself, Operational UK Firefighter Pete Wakefield. So wherever you are in the world, please support your emergency services. And thank you for listening.